morning again. If I haven't had the privilege of meeting you, my name is Chase. Uh, and if you came in after uh, the little game we played earlier, uh, I said I serve as the lead pastor here at the Corners Chapel and just so excited to be here with you all. If you have a Bible, go ahead and open to the book of Revelation. Revelation is where we're going to be this week in specifically chapter 3. Uh, and while you're turning there, uh, let me just say if this is your first time with us and uh, you have a church home, uh, we in no way are trying this morning to, to pull you from that. We're glad that you have uh, a church that you can worship at, and we are just glad that you're here today to, to celebrate with us on this exciting Sunday. But if you do not have a church that you can call home and you're a guest with us today, then hopefully uh, by the time you leave here today, this will feel like uh, a church that you feel like you belong. And so I just want to say on behalf of our congregation, welcome. Revelation chapter 3 is where we're going to be today. And while this is our relaunch series, or sorry, relaunch service, uh, we're actually finishing up a series that if this is a church that you call home, we've been in since the, the beginning of October, where we've been looking closely at the first three chapters in the last book of the Bible and really narrowing in on seven specific letters in the book of Revelation that were written to seven real churches in the first century. Right? Sometimes I think we think uh, the, the book of Revelation is like a riddle or a puzzle to be solved, and there are certain elements that are confusing, but at its core, the book of Revelation is really a letter to seven churches in the first century. And so the letter starts off with uh, a short message to these uh, addressed to seven specific churches in chapters 2 and 3 of Revelation. And we've been saying uh, that while these letters were written to specific churches, they also speak uh, and communicate uh, to all believers throughout time and uh, to all churches, and so they're very applicable to us today. And so we've been journeying through these seven letters, and uh, so far we looked at six of them, and today on our relaunch Sunday we're looking at the seventh. So I want to read from Revelation chapter 3, and if you're willing and if you're able, would you please stand with me for the reading of God's Word. Revelation chapter 3, starting in verse 14. Here's what it says. It says, And to the angel of the church in Laodicea write, The words of the Amen, the faithful and true witnesses, the beginning of God's creation. Verse 15, I know your works. You are neither cold nor hot. Would that you were either cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. Jump down to verse 20. Verse 20, it says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. The one who conquers, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne, as I also conquered and sat with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Father, thank you for today. Thank you for this this celebratory weekend as we celebrate our, our relaunch as the Corners Chapel. Uh, Lord, we pray just today that we will keep our eyes on you. Will you allow these words to convict us, but ultimately to encourage us and draw us closer to you. May I become less in this moment. May you become greater. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing to you, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You guys can have a seat. I want to start off this morning with a story from our nation's history. If you know me, you know I like history, and so I want to start off this morning with the story of Lewis and Clark. Who's heard of Lewis and Clark? Most of us have heard of those names. Who can tell me exactly what Lewis and Clark did? Not as many, right? Most of us, self-included, we know a lot of names of historical figures, but it's, maybe we get a little cloudy on what exactly they did. Well, on August 12th, of 1805, so 217 years ago, Meriwether Lewis climbed to the top of what is now known as the Limhi Pass on the border of what's now Mont Montana and Idaho. And it was at this moment when he climbed up to the top of this ridge that he discovered, or at least thought he discovered, what we now know today as the Rocky Mountains. I should have a picture of it. It's a pretty, pretty incredible view, right? The Rocky Mountains. Well, the problem was, that Meriwether Lewis and William Clark and their whole crew, they had been commissioned by Thomas Jefferson not to discover mountains, but to discover a water route that would connect the Mississippi River to the Pacific Ocean. 
Okay, now if you know geography, the, the Mississippi River does not connect to the, to the Pacific Ocean. And so they were hoping to find some sort of water route because water routes were, were extremely important for the economy. If you controlled the, the water route, then uh, you controlled the trade routes, and so you were flourishing economically. And, and so Thomas Jefferson commissioned Lewis and Clark, these explorers and, and a group of companions, uh, hoping that they would go off and find a water route that would reach the Pacific Ocean. And so they had with them their canoes, and that's why I got this paddle here, because they were, they were going and they were exploring, and they thought they were going to find a water route that led to the Pacific Ocean, but instead what they found was 300 miles of mountains that stretched upwards of 14,000 feet, and on top of those mountains they would find and have to walk through uh, uh, waist-deep, hip-deep snow for 60 miles. Okay, so... Everyone in this group, everyone, all of these experienced explorers and everyone in the United States at this time uh, that was considered an expert explorer, they thought that the terrain was the same from the Atlantic Ocean all the way to the Pacific Ocean. And so Lewis and Clark were experts in navigating what they had seen. Right? They were water guides, they were wilderness explorers, they were boat explorers, they were canoe experts, and they were planning on rowing their way to the Pacific Ocean, and they thought that what was in front of them would be exactly the same as what was behind them. They thought that everything in front of them was going to be the same as everything that was behind them, but then they hit the Rocky Mountains. And they realized that quote, and this is from uh, Lewis's journal, he said, we realized that 300 years of experts had been completely, utterly wrong, end quote. And so Lewis and Clark, again, canoe and water experts, they faced a choice. They could admit failure and just go back home. They could unsuccessfully attempt to continue using the, the methods that they had, or they could adapt. In his book, Canoeing the Mountains, which was uh, the inspiration for the story of Lewis and Clark, and it's also the title of today's message. In this book, author Todd Bollinger, he draws many parallels between this predicament that Lewis and Clark faced, where they thought they were going to the ocean, but they were going to the mountains. He draws parallels between them and the quandary that many Christians and many churches find themselves in today. Because for many of us, the last three years or maybe the last several decades have shown us a mass exodus from the church. And there's a rise in, in those who are denouncing Christianity and even in many locations an increase in outright opposition to Christianity. And I don't say this to be, you know, doom and gloom or create an us versus them narrative with those outside of the church, but simply to point out uh, that which has already been revealed to many of us, and that's that the days ahead of us in the religious landscape of our day are probably not like the days behind us. Sociologists and theologians refer to the period of history that we're living in in the West as post-Christian. Right, we, as a church, if you've been with us for a while, we've taken some, uh, some Sundays where we've looked intensively at church history. And so you may remember that uh, Christianity was made the official religion of Rome in uh, the 4th century. And so after that happened, for roughly 1,700 years all over the world, it began a period of what sociologists and, and theologians call Christendom. Right, a period in world history where Christianity has really been at the center of Western cultural life. I'm not saying that everyone for the last 1,700 years has been Christians, but, but Christendom has largely influenced the laws in the West. It's largely influenced morality. It's Christendom that gave the United States uh, under God in the Pledge of Allegiance. And, and believe it or not, even in many newspapers, uh, newspapers like the Los Angeles Times used to give lists of daily Bible readings and church suggestions for upcoming weeks. Right, that seems so foreign to us, and, and for most of us, those days seem like they're completely gone. Not globally, because the church is spreading at unprecedented rates in Asia and Africa and South America, but, but in our culture, it seems like we really have moved on into a post-Christian age. And in our country and many other countries in the West, even those with Christian origins, we're living in a day where church buildings are... Uh, and cathedrals have been relegated to, to more like tourist attractions. Amanda and I went to uh, Germany just a couple years ago, and it was so sad to see these churches that have had such storied past, and now they're basically just filled with, with tourism. 
We're living in a day when the fastest growing religious affiliation amongst young adults is none, not N-U-N, but N-O-N-E. And we're living in a day when there really is no moral consensus built on the Bible, even amongst Christians. And so the reality is that when we look at our culture, and even when we look at our, at our churches, and we're looking forward into a post-Christian day and age, unlike the days of Christendom, we realize that the path forward is not like the path behind us. You say, well, this doesn't seem like the hope-filled message that I was hoping to hear on relaunch Sunday. Well, actually, I think it is because Todd Bollinger in his book, uh, he, he draws comparisons, again, between the Lewis and Clark expedition and where we are today. And, and here's what he says. He says that what they did, they didn't immediately just, just throw out everything they had. They didn't just throw out their paddles and, and throw out their canoes and try to figure out what to do different. He said what they did was they returned to, the, to quote, the nuts and bolts of surviving and thriving. Okay, so, so when they were faced with this change and faced with this reality that they didn't expect, they said, let's go back to the basics. And once we go back to the basics, it's from there that we'll decide what we should do. Which brings us to the seventh church in this series in the, books of Reve- in the letters uh, to the churches in Revelation. Because again, uh, th- this, this letter, this whole book, the book of Revelation, was written to seven churches. And the first six that we've looked at, they all received some sort of uh, message of positivity from, from Jesus. Right? They said that, uh, th- that there was something that they were being commended for. They, some of them received some, some bad news. The second one, the church in Sardis was told that they'd be persecuted unto death. So that's not good news, but, but they still received uh, some positive uh, admonitions from the Lord. The sixth church was the only church to not get any bad news at all, the church in Philadelphia. But that sixth letter is immediately followed by this letter to the church in Laodicea, and they received no good news at all. Yet it's in this letter, this letter that was addressed to a church 2,000 years ago, in this letter I think we see a lot of parallels between their day and our 21st century Western cultural day that we live in today. And in these nine verses in this letter, I think that there's seven gospel truths, seven truths that we must understand if we're going to call ourselves a Christian. Seven truths that we as a church must embrace if we're not only going to survive in a post-Christendom era, but, but thrive. And so that's our outline for today, a seven-point summary of the gospel. The word gospel means good news. And so I want to give you the good news of Jesus in just seven sentences. And the first one is this, God is holy, holy, holy. God is holy, holy, holy. Holy. The book of Revelation begins by telling us exactly who it was that wrote the book of Revelation. It says in verse 1, it says this is the revelation of Jesus Christ. And so right, right away we know that while the Apostle John might have been the one who was writing on the paper, the ultimate author of the book of Revelation, and really the author of the whole Bible, is God himself. The author of Revelation is Jesus And in these seven letters, Jesus begins each letter by giving us a brief description about himself. Let me read through them quickly. The first one, the church in Ephesus. Jesus says that this letter is the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand. He who walks among the seven golden lampstands. And we talked about how the lampstands represent the churches. So Jesus is saying he's amongst the churches. The church in Smyrna, he says, these are the words of the first and the last who died and came to life. To Pergamum, he says, these are the words of him who has the sharp two-edged sword. To Thyatira, he says, these are the words of the Son of God who has eyes like a flame of fire and whose feet are like burnished bronze. To the church in Sardis, he's, he, he's telling them that these are the words of him who has the seven spirits of God and the seven star, stars. The, uh, the Philadelphian church is told that these are the words of he who's holy, uh, the holy one, the true one, the one who has the keys to David, who will open and shut doors and who shuts and no one opens. And then lastly, the church in Laodicea is told, what we read earlier, they're told that these are the words of the Amen the faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's creation. So what's going on here? Why why is Jesus giving all of these descriptions about himself at the start of every letter? Well, because he uses 20 names about himself and 20 descriptions about himself to emphasize all of these attributes to point towards the chief attribute about himself, which is that he's holy. He's showing us in in chapters 2 and 3 that which will ultimately be on display in chapter 4 when you get to this amazing picture of the throne room of Jesus. And and in many ways, God's holiness is the the culmination of all of his other attributes. 
I love this quote from the late Jerry Bridges, who is an author. It should be on the screen. That picture is way too far zoomed in. Jerry, sorry, Jerry got done dirty there. But, it, but here's what it says. It says, uh, it says, holiness is the perfection of all God's other attributes. His power is holy power. His mercy is holy mercy. His wisdom is holy wisdom. It is his holiness more than any other attribute that makes him worthy of our praise. And so the word holy, it just means set apart. And so when we say that God is holy, 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 it's not just saying that we're, we're showing reverence to him, but that when we're talking about his holiness, we're not just saying that he's a, a deity or that he's a celestial being. No, we're saying there's no one and there's nothing like him. I don't know if you caught the, the line in the hymn that we just sang a few moments ago, the line where the, the hymn writer is talking about the angels. Right? And, and says, not even the angels in the sky can barely, uh, can barely, can fully bear the sight, but downward bends their burning eyes at mysteries so bright. What does that mean? Well, the hymn writer is saying that God is so magnificent that even the angels cannot be compared to him. We're heading into the Christmas season, and a lot of people love to put uh, uh, angels at the top of their Christmas trees, and usually uh, the angels look like, uh, you know, some lady in a white robe with, with wings and and, and that's great, but many of the angelic beings in the Bible, when they're, when they're described, they look nothing like that, right? Uh, recently, I've seen some people that have gone to making uh, realistic, uh, biblical, biblically correct depictions of angels for their Christmas tree topper, toppings, and, uh, you know, that, that's, that's terrifying, right? There, there's a reason why when the angels show up, the first thing they have to say is, don't be afraid, because that's, that's terrifying, and we've read this many times, but let me read in, in Revelation chapter 4. This is uh, the angels acknowledging the holiness of God. We've read this before, uh, Revelation 4 verse 8. It says, And the four living creatures, these are angelic beings, each of them with six wings are full of eyes all around and within. And day and night they never cease to say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty and who was and is and is to come. And, and, and whenever the living creatures are giving glory and honor and thanks to him who is seated on the throne, who lives forever and ever, verse 10, the 24 elders fall down before him who's seated on the throne and worship him who lives forever, and they cast their, throne, their crowns before the, the throne, saying, Worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things. See, this is what's going on in heaven for all eternity. Why? Because God is holy, 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 and deserving of our praise forever. And, the, and, and here in the seventh letter to the church, Jesus begins, just like in all the other letters, by reminding us of his holiness. But look at the first part of the next verse, verse 15. Again, Jesus is the one speaking, and he says, I know your works. Okay, pause right there. I know your works. Do you see the, the discrepancy, right? The, 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 the introduction is about God's holiness, that he's perfect, that he's stainless, that he's pure. And he says, but I know your works. Anyone want to compare themselves to the description of Jesus we just read in Revelation 4? Right? Or all those attributes that are listed? No, which leads to statement number two. We all have fallen short of God's righteous standard, and we deserve God's righteous judgment. If you're a guest with us today, you might be thinking, man, I knew this. I knew I was going to come to church and hear about how bad I am, how messed up I am, how, how I need to be judged. Uh, I'm just going to leave here feeling down on myself. Well, no, that's not my intention at all. I already said I have good news. The word gospel means good news, but we say this all the time. The good news is only good in light of the bad news. Right? And the bad news is that all of us have broken the laws of God, that because of our sinfulness, we have all fallen short of God's standard of perfection. And you might be thinking, you don't know me. Right? I'm not a bad person. Well, again, I'm not trying to fill you with a sense of guilt as you leave here, but I'm trying to show us that, that we can't compare ourselves to others. We can't compare ourselves to people. We can't even compare ourselves to our own standards of morality, but to God's standard of perfection. And when we compare ourselves to that, then all of us fall short. That's what the Apostle Paul means in Romans 3 when he says, all of us, all of humanity, everyone to ever live has sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Right? Even if we don't perceive our actions as that bad, friends, we must understand that even the smallest violation of God's commands is enough to say that we've broken the law and therefore broken any sort of relationship with him. 
You know, I wish that I could stand here and say, hey, hey, let's just pat ourselves on the back. Let's just try as hard as we can. But that's not the gospel. And brothers and sisters, it's absolutely crucial that in order for us to embrace the good news, we have to really wrestle with and really, really grasp the severity of the bad news. And the bad news is that the nature and depth of our innate sinfulness, when juxtaposed to the holiness of God, shows us that we have fallen woefully short of God's perfect standard. And even worse, he knows it. And he said, he know, he said, I know your acts. And if that's not bad enough, let's go one step deeper. Point three, if God is holy and we, we are far from holy, then it would follow that our sin is worse than we think. Our sin is worse than we think. One of the most helpful visuals uh, I, I've seen with regards to this is the picture of a, a quartz sphere. I don't know if you've ever seen one. We should have a couple pictures on the screen. Uh, and the second floor of the Natural History Museum in uh, Washington, D.C. They're said to be the, the largest flawless quartz sphere in the entire world, and it's a little bigger than a basketball. And on that sphere, there's no visible scratches at all, not even a mark or, or any sort of discolorization or, or anything. It's, it's by our standards, it's, it's perfection. Right? And in his book, What is the Gospel?, Pastor Greg Gilbert, a pastor in Louisville, Kentucky, he uses this, this image of a flawless court sphere to say uh, that that's what people think of when they think of, of human nature. That, that every once in a while we might smear it up a little bit, that it, we might drop it in the mud, it might get a little dirty, it might get some scratches, but underneath it, it's really perfectly clean. And all we need to do is wipe off that dirt in order to restore its brilliance. But according to the Bible, the human nature is not like that at all. And the mud is not just smeared on the outside because the Apostle Paul, when he says uh, in, in Ephesians 2, he says, we are by nature children of wrath. And when he says in Romans 5 that, that we are all, we're all included in Adam and Eve's guilt and corruption. And in Matthew 15, even Jesus says it's out of the heart that come our evil thoughts. And if we truly believe that, and that's what the Bible teaches, then we realize we're not just muddy on the outside, but uh, there's not just some cracks and some dirt on the outside, but we're filled with filth and corruption that go all the way to the center. And look at the rest of verse 15 in Revelation 3. Jesus, in addressing the sin of the church of Laodicea, he says, I know your works, right? We already said that, that's not good. But he goes on to say, he says, you're neither hot nor cold. Would that you were either cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. What does this mean? Now, this is what the church in Laodicea is most known for. Out of, out of the whole letter, they're often called the, the lukewarm church. What does this mean? Well, we can get all into the geography and how there were streams that, that were probably lukewarm that went into the city. I think that's helpful at times. But what I want us to focus on is Jesus says they're lukewarm, and then he says, because they're lukewarm, he's going to spit them out. Right? Uh, let, me, let me do something real quick, an informal poll. Who, who all is coffee drinkers? Okay, most of us like coffee, right? That's why you're at church today. Uh, coffee and Jesus, there we go. And, and so uh, only answer for, for one of these questions, who likes hot coffee better? Who's team hot coffee? All right. Who's team cold coffee? All right, a few. Who's team, like, Seven hours old, been sitting on the desk, you forgot about it, cup of coffee. Oh, okay, we have a couple people there. <laughs> but no, most of us, we don't like lukewarm coffee, right? We like hot coffee. We like cold coffee. Lukewarm coffee is good for nothing except <laughs> reminding you that you are bad at finishing things, right? That's all lukewarm coffee is good for. And, and so what does Jesus say? Why is he saying that they're lukewarm and that he's going to spit them out? Well, he's saying that he wishes that they were, that they were hot. That they, that they were like, uh, that they had a, a tendency to, where they were hot with the gospel and the gospel spreading like wildfire or that they're cold, not cold hearted, but like ice water, right? Able to be refreshing to the souls of those who need healing and refreshing. So he's saying, I wish that you were on fire for the gospel or I wish that you were refreshing and cold, but you're just lukewarm. He says, I, I got no use for that. And he says, those people, he's going to spit them out. What does that mean? Well, the Bible makes it clear that the final destination of unrepentant and unbelieving sinners is eternal conscious torment in a place called hell. And friends, I know that's not popular to talk about, and it would be much easier for me just to ignore all of these warnings and all of these passages and just to come up here and talk about something not controversial at all. But I can't water this down at all because, to quote, to paraphrase uh, the Puritan Thomas Watson, he said, till sin, which includes its punishment, till sin and its punishment be bitter, Christ will never be sweet. 
and it's a bitter reality to realize that those who are lukewarm, which even includes many who think that they're Christians but are not, will spend eternity separated from God forever. And that, that's haunting, isn't it? That even some of those who think that they're on God's side is what Matthew chapter 7 tells us, that, that many will say, Lord, Lord, I, I knew you. Didn't I, didn't I prophesy in your name? And Jesus will say, depart from me, for I never knew you. That's, that's terrifying. But the truth is that there are many who are completely lukewarm and are completely okay with it. And friends, what I want you to know is that being lukewarm in your faith and being a Christian, being a lukewarm Christian is an oxymoron. You, you can't be a lukewarm Christian. Uh, hear, hear what I'm not saying. I'm not saying that no Christian ever finds him or herself displaying characteristics of those who are lukewarm. I'm not saying that every single moment of your life is going to be just on fire for Jesus all the time when you're a follower of Jesus. But what I'm saying is that if your entire life is marked by lukewarmness in your faith, then you really need to ask yourself, are you a true Christian? Because the warning Jesus has towards those who are lukewarm is serious, right? He says he's going to spit them out of his mouth. And so clearly he's equating lukewarmness to being an unbeliever because he already says that, that believers are held eternally secure. Pastor J.D. Greer, a pastor in North Carolina, when he was uh, writing about this passage, he gave nine examples of lukewarm faith. He gives nine examples of people who call themselves Christians but are really lukewarm. And again, brothers and sisters, I know that almost all of us can probably find ourselves somewhere on this list. So if you find yourself on this list and you know that you are in Christ, uh, let it be convicting to you. But my goal is not to try and show this so that you're filled with uncertainty of your faith. But I'm showing this with the hopes that if the vast majority of this list describe you, then may the day be the day that you say, I'm done being lukewarm. I want to truly follow Jesus. But here's what he says. He says, number one, Lukewarm Christians, and Christians is in quotes because you can't be a lukewarm Christian. Lukewarm Christians don't really want to be saved from their faith. They only want to be saved from the penalty of their sin. Right? So to lukewarm Christians, and again, uh, Christians is in quotes, but to those who are lukewarm, God is just a fire escape, if you will. But he's not the holy God that they're worshiping. Number two, lukewarm Christians are moved by stories and people who do radical things for Christ, yet they don't do radical things themselves. Now, this isn't about radical in the sense of, of leaving, moving to another country. But no, even seeing this as the word of God is considered by many to be radical in our culture, right? And to those who are lukewarm, what Jesus expects of his followers is seen as radical, not something to be obeyed. Lukewarm Christians equate their, their partially sanitized lives with holiness. In other words, those who are lukewarm do just the minimum in an effort to clean themselves up or to be sanitized. But Jesus didn't call us to, to, to just be sanitized, right? He called us to be his followers. Number four, lukewarm Christians rarely share their faith with their neighbors and coworkers or friends. We'll come back to this in the final point, but this is huge. Uh, lukewarm Christians think about life on earth more than they think about eternity in heaven. Lukewarm Christians love their luxuries and rarely give to the poor in truly sacrificial ways. Number eight, lukewarm Christians do not live by faith. Their lives are structured so that they never have to. And then number nine, lukewarm Christians care more about political allegiance than kingdom mission. And again, if you feel like you're being called out, you know, I'm sure all of us can find ourselves somewhere on this list. But we, we have to ask, not only do we display any of these characters, but uh, does the whole thing describe us? Because if the whole list describes you, then friend, it would be unloving and it would be cruel and it would be heartless of me to not plead to ask yourself, am I a Christian? Am I a follower of Jesus who just sometimes struggles with these things or am I characterized by lukewarmness and therefore outside of the everlasting grasp of the Savior? And again, hear what I'm not saying. I'm not saying that this is a checklist and you just do all of that and then uh, you earn your way to heaven. No, I'm saying that if you're truly in Christ, you cannot help but to be on fire for the gospel. And you, and you can't help but to be filled with the cold, refreshing water of life that Jesus has to offer and to extend that lovingly to others. And if you're feeling pretty down or hopeless and wondering why you came today just to hear a message like this, well, this is where the good news begins. Because our next point is this, God will not abandon those who earnestly repent. God will not abandon those who earnestly repent. Look at verse 17 of Revelation 3. 
Verse 17, it says, For you say, I am rich, I have prospered, and I need nothing, not realizing that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. Verse 18, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by the fire, so that you may be rich, and white garments, so that you may clothe yourself, and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen. Now, what's he saying? He's, he's illustrating people that we see all throughout our society. It, 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 that's what he's doing, right? He's describing those that not only don't realize their need for the gospel, but those that even say they don't need the gospel. So you see, I think uh, w- one of the problems in our culture is that on one side of the spectrum, we have those who, who do grasp the first part of this message and realize their sinfulness, and they just don't know how to find hope. Right? And, and maybe this is you, and you put all of your efforts into just trying to earn your salvation whether that's through social work or or giving or just trying to follow all the rules and it's just not filling the God-shaped hole in your life. But then on the other side of the spectrum are those who are described in this verse that not only are unable to find hope and rest, but overtly saying, I I don't need this. I'll figure it out on my own. And Jesus is saying, no, you won't. He's saying, you're broken, you're, you're wretched, you're poor, you're blind, but I can make you rich. He's not talking about prosperity and wealth in this life, but he's saying, I can make you rich because the debt that you owe before God, because of your sinfulness, he's saying, I've already paid it. And I can clothe you because the stains of sin and shame that you have on your life uh, coming to me, I've done what's necessary to remove those stains from you. And if you feel like you're going through trials and feels like your life is falling apart, it feels like you've hit rock bottom. Jesus is saying right here, you may feel like you've hit rock bottom, but I want you to know that I am the rock that's at the bottom, which leads to point number five. God has provided one way for us to escape the punishment that we all deserve. Look at verse 20. Jesus says, behold, I, this is Jesus talking. Jesus says, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in him and eat with him and he with me. This is the gospel, right? that Jesus is standing at the door knocking and all we have to do is open the door and let him in. This is the good news, that our sin eternally separates us from a holy and perfect God, but because that holy and perfect God so loved the world, he sent his son Jesus. And so that through Jesus' death on the cross and his resurrection from the dead, he took our place. Right, that, that he stood in the gap and bore the weight of God's wrath that was righteously directed at us. And so now, if we put our faith in Jesus, our relationship with God is mended and our shame and our guilt are removed. And God looks at us and he sees the perfection of his son. Because his wrath has been appeased. To, to use a big theological word, Jesus, in his death on the cross, in his resurrection, he is our propitiation. Or propitiation, that's a big theological word that just means the appeasement of God's wrath. So, so God's wrath is propitiated or it's, it's placated by the finished work of Jesus. And who's Jesus? Jesus is God, right? In other words, since Jesus reconciled us to God, stay with me here, since Jesus reconciled or mended our broken relationship with God and Jesus is God, then that means that God is actually the propitiation for his own wrath. Well, what can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. One theologian says it like this, we are saved from God, for God, by God. But what we must understand is that this propitiation, this saving grace is infinite in its power because it bridges the infinite gap between us and a holy God, but God's grace is not infinite in its, in its extent. What do I mean by that? I mean, like we just read, that Jesus says he's at the door knocking. In other words, the call to follow Jesus has been sent out to all, but only those who answer the door can eat. It's like like DoorDash. They can deliver it to your door, but unless you actually open the door and grab the food, it's all for nothing. The late R.C. Sproul put it like this in his book, The Holiness of God. He said, God's grace is not infinite. God is infinite, and God is gracious. We experience the grace of an infinite God, but grace is not infinite. God sets limits to his patience and forbearance. He warns us over and over again that someday the ax will fall and his judgment will be poured out. And so I have to ask, have you answered the door? 
Have you surrendered your life to Jesus and said, Lord, I know the punishment for my sin is death. I'm deserving of death. I can't save myself from the, from the penalty, from the punishment of sin, but I want to trust wholly in your sacrifice. That's what it means to open the door. And friends, truly trusting in Christ's propitiation not only results in us getting to heaven, not only results in just escaping punishment, but it has immediate implications now, which leads to the last two points. Number six, trusting fully in Christ's propitiation will result in a renewed sense of missional urgency. If we know that everything that we've talked about is true, that we were headed on a path towards destruction, but because Jesus sent his son to save us, then how can we not do everything that we can to share that good news with others? Recently, I heard a story about a, a famous atheist who was interviewed years ago. You may have heard this story. He was, uh, he's still an atheist, but he was talking about an experience that he had with a Christian after one of his, one of his shows. He's a, a magician. And he says that a Christian came up and tried to give him a Bible. Now, he's still an atheist, but here's what he said. He said, I've always said, I don't respect people who don't evangelize. Okay, this, is an, this is an atheist talking. He's talking uh, about Christians. And he says, I don't respect Christians who don't evangelize. This is, this is what he says. He says, I don't respect that at all. If you truly believe that there's a heaven and a hell and people could be going to hell or not getting eternal life or whatever, and you think it's not really worth telling them this because it will make you feel socially awkward. Again, this is, this is an atheist. He says, how much do you have to hate somebody not to evangelize to them? How much do you have to hate someone to believe everlasting life is possible and not tell them about it? And then, and this guy's preaching even though he doesn't believe. He says, he says, if I believe beyond a shadow of a doubt that a truck was coming to you and you didn't believe it, and that truck was bearing down on you, there's a certain point that I just tackle you. And this is more important than that. And so even atheists realize that if we believe what we say that we believe, then we have to share it. It's, it's the loving thing to do. And we might be called intolerant. We might be called, you know, fill in the blank, because as our society and our world begins to look more post-Christian uh, and, and we leave Christendom behind, we, we, we might be called whatever. But friends, and this is our last point, trusting fully in Christ's propitiation will result in a shift in how we view the post-Christian landscape of our day. And it'll change it completely because instead of us just shrinking back and, and watching the, 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 the news through a lens of fear or anger or being filled with hatred towards those who disagree with us, we're ultimately filled with hope because we know that no matter how bad things get on this side of heaven, all of history is building towards a day when every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord, and we can be filled with this love because it's through our love towards the outside world and through our love with each other that we show the outside world that this Jesus thing is something that they should not only want, but it's something that they need. Friends, this is why we exist as a church, and this is why we're launching today as the Corners Chapel. Because if, like the early explorers were right, like the, the early explorers, they started with a dream, right? And we, like these early explorers, started with a dream. We started with a map, right? We thought we were going to do things one way. We had the launch plan for the Chapel Nordonia spread out. We thought we were prepared to launch this church, but then we came to a ridge. And when we came over that ridge and we didn't see the, the Rocky Mountains, right? We saw March of 2020. We said it doesn't look like the days ahead of us are like the days behind us. And in just a short couple years of our church, our church is only a little over two years old, and we've seen a global pandemic. We've seen racial and political tension. We've seen a rise in those deconstructing from the church. We've seen a rise in vocal opposition towards the church. And even in the chapel as a whole, we've seen division within the body of Christ. And so we, like Lewis and Clark, are faced with a choice. We can throw it all away and say, well, that was a nice run, but we didn't sign up for all that. We can try and do things the exact way that they've been done for the last 1,700 years and, and just try and expect people just to show up here on their own. Or we can say, we're done looking backwards. It's time to look forward and adapt. And like Todd Bollinger said, adapting doesn't come just by completely throwing out everything you've been doing, but by returning to the nuts and bolts. And what are the nuts and bolts of our faith? It's what we just talked about, the seven-point gospel. It should be on the screen. 
that God is holy, holy, holy. That because we've fallen short of God's righteous standard, we deserve God's righteous judgment or, or we face death. That our sin is worse than we think. That God will not abandon those who earnestly repent. And God has provided one way for us to escape the punishment that we all deserve, propitiation. And trusting fully in Christ, propitiation will result in a, in a renewed sense of missional urgency. And it will result in a shift in how we view the post-Christian landscape of our day. That's the whole point of this message. That's the whole point of all of the messages that are preached here at the Corners Chapel. That's the whole point of our church. That even through the difficult days, it's been amazing to see that God is still at work. But I'd be lying if I stood up here and said that the last two to three years have just been easy, but even amongst the difficulties, it's been amazing to see the family that God has started here. Right, to see the inception of life-giving friendships and to see that we've, we've weeped together and rejoiced together and that hopefully this local church family called the Corners Chapel will far outlive any of us should Jesus not return in his lifetime. Amen. But let me read just one final quote from Todd Bollinger in his book, Canoeing the River. I think this is an excellent quote for us to begin our descent this morning. He says, he says, it's crucial to remember again that the goal of the expedition, he's talking about Lewis and Clark, was not to build a family. Where he talks about how through the difficulties they all came closer together. And if you know the story of uh, Sacagawea who was with them and just they had some amazing relationships. It's all chronicled in their diaries. But he says the ultimate goal was not to build a family. It was to find a route to the Pacific Ocean. Similarly, the goal of the Christian faith is not simply to become a more loving community, but to be a community of people who participate in God's mission to heal the world by reestablishing his loving reign on earth as it is in heaven. That's why we're here, right? So that this, the, the seven points, that, that, that this gospel will transform lives, not just locally, but extend all the way to all the corners of the earth so that all will know the name of Jesus. That's the whole point of our church. That by the spread of the gospel, it will be as earth on earth as it is in heaven and that God will be seen as Lord of all. That's the whole reason we're here. But check this. That's the whole point of this whole series. That's the whole point of these seven letters. Ephesus was called out because they lost their love for the holiness of God. They got so caught up in all the other aspects of the church that they lost their love for a God who was holy, holy, holy. Smyrna's told, you're going to die. And for them, it was righteous persecution that re result in their death. But for all of us, we have to understand that the reality is that we have righteous punishment that's headed towards us if we don't repent. And that leads to death. Pergamum was called out for their sin, that they failed to see how serious their sin was. Thyatira was told to repent. Sardis, do you remember what Sardis means? As Sardis, the word Sardis means those escaping. And church, God has provided a way for us to escape the penalty that we deserve through the love of Jesus. And so therefore, like the church in Philadelphia, the door is open for us to live on mission and to spread the love of God. And yes, the cultural landscape of our day, it looks daunting. It looks like what's described in Laodicea. But church, I'm here to tell you that with our eyes focused on Jesus, with our eyes focused on the one who walks amongst the lampstands, with our eyes focused on the one who will one day return to gather his church and the one who is by his blood made us holy in the eyes of the heavenly father with our eyes focused on Jesus we do not have to fear the moral decay of our culture because God has been and is currently and until he returns he will always be working through history and using the churches that listen to his voice to establish his loving reign on earth as it is in heaven I started with a historical story, a story that has greatly impacted our nation. And so let me end with a quote from something that has had an equally large impact on our culture, The Office. Dekayla can fact check me on this, but the final episode of The Office, there's a quote by this guy. It's probably my least favorite person in the show, but he delivers my favorite line in the whole show. It's the last episode. Things are changing, everything's 
different from the first season. People have moved away. People have gotten married. People have entered into relationships. People have broken up from relationships. The office is going to look completely different. The days ahead are going to look completely different than the days behind. And in, in, in a reflective, almost serious moment in the show that's not that serious, Andy Bernard, this character, he delivers what I think is the most thought-inducing line of the whole show. He says, I wish there was a way to know that you're in the good old days before you've actually left them. Now, we've all felt this, right? In our individual lives, maybe in our families, you know, maybe as we move back towards the, the holiday season, maybe there's a painful sting of nostalgia as we reflect on Christmases long, long ago because those were the good old days, right? And it's hard to recapture those. And when we look at the news and we hear of wars and rumors of wars, it can be easy for us to wonder, are the good old days of Christianity behind us? Is there nothing but pain in post-Christendom ahead? And to that I say, absolutely not. Because brothers and sisters, when the days ahead of us are dedicated to him and focused on being used by him, when, when we can all earnestly pray, Lord, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Not because we want earth to look exactly like heaven with no pain and suffering. We know that won't come until Jesus comes back. But when we're saying, Jesus, we want your will to be done, just like it's done in heaven, and we know that your will will be done, and we want you to use us to spread your love and the simple message of the gospel to the whole world, if that is our mindset then friends, we can say with confidence that yes, the days ahead are unlike the days behind, but they're actually better. And regardless of what's around us, we can know that we're living in the good old days now when all of our days are dedicated to him. Father, thank you for your word. Lord, thank you that you can encourage us, that you can convict us, but ultimately that your love is still felt. Lord, help us not to, to run from the difficult passages of Scripture. To help, help us not to just only see you as a cruel, vindictive judge, but to realize that even in your judging, you're righteous and you love us. And you've provided one way for us to escape from the penalty that we all deserve. Lord, would you just convict us with the gospel this morning? Lord, we want to see your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. Will you use us? Will you use this church? Lord, for the rest of this service, we just want to dedicate this church and our lives to you. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Hey, everybody. Thank you so much for tuning in to this message. I hope it was an encouragement to you, and I hope you were blessed by it. Uh, if you want any more information about who we are, about our church, be sure to go to our website, thecornerschapel.com. Thank you, and be blessed.